Welcome to another episode of Startup Health Now, the weekly show celebrating the healthcare transformers and change makers who are reimagining healthcare. My name is Stephen Krein. And I'm Unity Stokes. And on today's episode, we're going to sit down and talk to our friend, uh, Samer Hamada, the CEO of Zeal.com and also the former CEO and founder of Vault.com. Uh, we're going to dig into the unique positioning in a growth market and lots of other great things from a serial entrepreneur, angel investor, and YPOer. It is the duty of leaders to lead, of the creative to create, of the daring to do. The free world expects leadership of us. Its fate and our fate depends upon our leadership. We are industrious, inventive, restless, with the fires that burn within us. Well, I say that nothing is easy, and the best things are the hardest. And all our troubles, all our immense difficulties, now and in the future, can I say, be solved if we have the will, the courage. The future is to those who take those who take it. Welcome back to Startup Health Now, the weekly show celebrating the healthcare transformers and change makers reimagining healthcare. I am so excited to have my friend Samer on today's episode. Um, Samer, I've known you, uh, I hate to say, since the, the Web 1.0 days um, when you were building. Why do you hate to say it? That's a great thing. <laughs> Mid 90s. Serial entrepreneurs older. in the house. Yeah, uh, really excited to have you on uh, today's episode. And I think for so many reasons, you're a perfect example for. Um, entrepreneurs in inside of the healthcare space to kind of see um, not only what it's like to be an entrepreneur from someone who's been an entrepreneur for a while, but also I uh, love the fact that you weren't a healthcare entrepreneur the first time right. around, but you are now. So I want to kind of take a step back in an understanding of uh, dig into your background a little bit. Um, out of college, when did you start your first company? Yeah, well, I, actually, I, um, I came out to New York uh, after grad school, and my business partner, Mark Oldman, and I ended up writing a couple of books for Random House, and they were on internships. So the common thread that has run throughout my career is creating transparency around information. You're really unlocking information. So these books helped college kids figure out where all the great internships were. So we would write these profiles, and granted this is the early 90s, on MTV, Mattel Toys, Boeing, and nobody had ever done that. So all of a sudden, my, my favorite story is MTV went from getting 100 applications a year for their summer intern program to the next year 11,000. Wow. <laughs> and they called us, begging us to turn off this profile, you know, pull it out of the book. But of course we wouldn't. So, um, so just unlocking all that information, telling people pricing, what campuses they were going to, I'm sorry, I meant salaries, what campuses people were going to, when the deadlines were, nobody had that information, you know, so and ever. The entrepreneurial bug from the beginning, it sounds oh, like. Oh, the too. very beginning. In seventh grade, I sold candy on, on my <laughs> school campus because they had a commissary, you know, where you could buy candy at recess and, you know, half the kids could never buy because it was like a 15 minute recess break. So I showed up one day with the Costco box. Blow Pops? Uh, blow Pops, Snickers <laughs> bars, M&Ms. And after a couple of weeks, the principal was like, hey, I got to shut you down. You're taking business away from us. And I actually convinced him not to shut me down because I said, I'm just taking all this excess demand that you guys aren't fulfilling. So you're not losing and the kids are winning. He's like, I like that argument. So anyway, I kept selling. But yeah, I've, I've wanted to, like I said, unlock this information sort of from the very beginning. And so we took these books, launched Vault, which, you know, as most people know, helped college kids, MBAs, law students figure out which firms to apply to, what all the interview questions were, what salaries were being paid, you what know, year, which what firms year were best. We launched Vault in early 97. Okay. And, um, and, you know, we did that for, you know, 10 years before we sold the company. And I always like to say what was really funny about Vault is these these kids were so desperate for this information and they were often waiting till the last minute to get it because the interview was like tomorrow or the next day. So about 40% of our orders in the early 90s were FedEx for our print guides. And then later when we turned them into downloadable PDFs, you know, people would download the PDF, you know, and just within a minute you had your information, even if it was two in the morning, seven in the morning, whether you were in Hong Kong, it's really pretty awesome. So what would you learn while you were doing vault.com about, you know, positioning, you, you know, clearly, you know, to, we're going to talk a lot about zeal, but going back to vault yeah. days, what was it that you learned about unique positioning and how important that was well, to building the company? You basically have to really get under the skin of the customer to figure out 
what he or she is like desperate to have, you know, and if you can fulfill that need, then you have a real business. And actually, there'll, there'll be relevancy to zeal because the hypothesis for the original zeal, we didn't quite get it right, so we'll talk about that later. But yeah, people were desperate to get this information on the interview questions and the salaries and you know, just to be well prepared for these things. So they paid and you know, they, they would like call us if the website wasn't working right. They would like post it you know, on, on web forums. Uh, it was really interesting just how, how, how much they you know, connected to the brand because they really wanted this info. And what, what was the unique positioning of Vault? Like how did, you, how did you frame it to the market as well, not just your customers, but how did you well, explain it? Well, our tagline was the most trusted name in career information. So for the employers, it was like, you know, we have all this great information on you that you yourself don't even have, which was true. The, the companies wouldn't even give up this info mm -hmm. if they even understood it themselves. And, um, and because of that, we had the consumers on our site, you know, you know, stickiness was the key word back then. They're posting messages, they're buying these guides, um, they're, they're um, you know, interacting with other students on the forums and sharing info. And so because of that, the employers gave us money to reach those people, right, through advertising, job postings, you know, uh, sponsoring events on campus. So you sold your company around 2007 or 07, so. 07, yeah. Um, what, what inspired you to leap into health and wellness? Well, there was a step in between. So I was an early investor in something called campusfood.com. And so I joined the board right after we sold Vault. And for a little while, I served on an interim management committee while we were looking for a CEO. And I was on the search committee for the CEO. And about a year later, we finally hired one. And then we sold that company to Grubhub. And what's interesting about that experience is I learned the power of you know, instant gratification, which again, <laughs> un Vault had instant gratification too, but campus food even more so. Everything was delivering pizza and subs, you know, like Seamless here in New York, uh, to hungry college kids at you know, 9 p.m., 11 p.m., Saturday, 2 a.m., you know, wings. Literally and, a starving market. Literally, right? <laughs> right, the students are desperate. They're you know, going on the web, they're looking up their old orders, they're pressing the submit button and they're getting their order 30, 40 minutes later. So I realized, you know, again, you serve a starving market. I like that, starving market, uh, a hungry market. You really can create a powerful business. So that's what Zeal is today. Mm -hmm. you know, we're serving these so people. You, you did that right? company af after Vault.com, sort of yeah. saw, saw this, uh, this new opportunity and then that exposed something uh, in health and wellness? Yeah, yeah, so after we sold Campus Food to Grubhub, I was free, you know, and I ended up joining Lightspeed Venture Partners as an entrepreneur in residence. And I said to myself, you know, what are the next great categories where you have to unlock information, you know, serve a desperate consumer? And right away, it was like, it's health and wellness, right? It was one of the last industries that seemed like, I guess education too around this time, where there really wasn't much, you know, in the way of clear information. Very frustrated consumer, you know, as you know, a lot of paper pushing. It just seemed to me like you could create some sort of website or service where you could help the consumer transact in a much more pleasant way, in a way that, you know, has uh, a lot more information, a lot clearer. I mean, even pricing in healthcare was like, how much does anything cost? Yeah, What's that's my still a yeah, massive, massive you problem. You go to that transparency yeah. issue yeah. you were talking about at the beginning, and then you come over to healthcare, and there's not much transparency. No, no. So we said, look, let's tackle this thing. And the early zeal was a health and wellness marketplace, mostly around alternative healthcare, acupuncture, chiropractic, massage, yoga, personal training, and a bunch of other categories. That was day one when day you launched one, it. Okay. Day one, a lot of content. I mean, people didn't even know what myofascial release was. They didn't know what acupuncture even meant. And so we were writing this stuff about and taking video, making video and taking pictures of the size of the needles in acupuncture and the history of acupuncture and the different kinds of acupuncture and what's the schooling period like and what does it mean to be licensed. Nobody had any of this information out there. And the reception was really nice in the beginning. And I like to say Zeal was awesome at discovery, this early Zeal. People learned about treatments. They found vendors in their zip code. They could see the price list. We put price lists up for stuff that nobody had ever put up before. Mm -hmm. So the early reception was quite good. 
I think what we, where we failed was we didn't have a business model that really was scalable. We were charging these vendors a lead gen fee or a monthly you know, software tools fee or a monthly marketing fee, and there just wasn't a lot of money there. Um, so so anyway. how long did it take you to, to figure that out? It sounds like you had the, you had the category down. You, you knew you were yeah. going to focus on health and wellness. Um, you had this position, initial positioning down, and then how long did it take you to sort of discover that you needed yeah. to make a change? Well, it was about 18 months. Um, so this part of what we did was good. I didn't think every entrepreneur has to do this, just hopefully as cheaply as possible. Customer discovery. Exactly. And, and customer pain points, right? What exactly <clears throat> is a customer going through and how can you create a different experience so that the customer is delighted, to use an overused you know, word these days. So we were, we were transacting you know, every day, you know, dozens and dozens of transactions. By the end of the 18 month period, we had processed around 30,000 different appointments across the country and across 12 categories. So there's a lot of data there. Mm. What time and what day and time are people ordering? What are they ordering? How much are they spending? Uh, what's going on in each category. So we started sifting through the data and about half of our orders were for massage. So we thought that's interesting. So massage is more frequent than the other categories. Uh, we noticed that massage um, had this, what we like to call on-demand characteristic. So about 55% of the requests are from within four hours of when they make People want a massage now. Yeah, so there was this now factor that wasn't really the case in the other categories. People could wait three days to go see an acupuncturist or you know, they would sift through different personal trainers before buying a 10 pack, say, with, with somebody. Or they might sign up for a yoga class the next day or two days from now. But with massage, there was this thing where my back hurts right now, my hip is killing me right now, I just had the worst day at work, I'm, I'm heading home and I want to get a massage. Or I just landed in Des Moines, Iowa, and I need somebody to massage me before my business meeting tonight. And they'd start calling around or posting something on the web, and they couldn't get it. And we'd feel their frustration. You know, they're just like, what's the price? Can you find me somebody? No, I want a female. No, that's too expensive. Um, no, that time doesn't work for me. And, uh, and on the flip side, the vendor, the massage therapist, also is feeling the pain. Who is that guy? I don't want to go to the hotel room. No, I need more money than what he's offering. Um, what about tip? Is he going to tip me? Tons of friction. Lots Tons of, of friction. friction. Lots of friction. So we just, we just saw all that and, and, and myself getting massages, seeing how frustrating it was. It would take me 45 minutes sometimes in a city to get a massage if I could get one at all. I'm like, we've got, there's got to be a better way to do this. So that's, that's when the light so, bulb So what off. happens as an entrepreneur when you've been operating for, for 18 months, you've got this whole plan, you start digging into the data, uh, you're not, you, you know the business model's not quite there yet, um, but you see some, some real opportunities in the data. What, what do you do? It's very hard, right? For most entrepreneurs, I would suspect you just stick with the inertia and eventually you run out of money. And Did you have plenty of money in the bank or were you, was, it, was we that money We had money in the bank, but to Unity's point, you know, we had sold this vision to investors and to go back to them and, and the team, quite frankly. And so I started to talk to the team, you know, I, I think there's something else here. And, you know, you get resistance from some of your own team members, quite frankly. You're like, oh, I didn't, I didn't join, you know, a massage company. I joined this big health and wellness play with data and, and software and what are you telling me here? And same with the investors, they're like, well, what is this thing? So uh, my wife always likes to point out, she's like, it's so funny, you know, 18 months ago, a lot of VCs were saying, this sounds too niche how many people could possibly want a massage now, let alone ever? Just doesn't seem like an interesting yep. idea. Fast forward to today and we've got you know, pretty fast growth, you know, a lot of new copycats in the category, a lot of VCs calling saying like, hey, this, this is interesting actually. People and how do you describe this. Zeal now? Because I think that's, I just wanna. Many different that. ways, but in a nutshell, it's like press a button, get a massage. So massage on demand. Massage on demand, yeah, the massage on demand So just app. like, and I hate to use the analogy of Uber, but just like yeah. I can call a cab, I can call a massage therapist yeah. to come to my home, hotel, or anywhere, yep. or work. and you have rapidly expanded um, outside of the New York area. Tell us a yeah. little bit about your, you know, the markets you serve. Yeah, we spent the last few months setting up all of South Florida, so that's Miami up to Palm Beach, all of uh, Los Angeles greater area and then the entire San Francisco Bay Area and the reception and you're in great. New York as well and we're in New York and, the Hamptons. and, then, and we've expanded in New York exactly we're in all of the Hamptons actually all of Long Island now Westchester 
we're doing a beta right now in um, western New Jersey and southern Connecticut. So, um, you know, this thing has legs. Like, you know, when... Yeah, when, how, how big does this get? I mean, we think it's a billion dollar plus global company. You know, massage in the US is somewhere between 10 and 12 billion. And it's one of the most highly fragmented industries I've ever seen, right? It's all these little spas. Um, some of the big chains like Bliss are still only 16 units um, or Red Door Spa for that matter. Really the biggest company in massage is a company called Massage Envy. And I would say that ultimately, you know, I think that that's who we're taking share from. Uh, if I can say that so boldly, they're a billion dollar company. Yeah, no, well, I, I think it's important just to, I want to zero in on this because um, we, we continually see, and I think the market's gotten a lot more crowded uh, across all of healthcare, right? So funding is exploding. There's a tremendous amount of yeah. uh, startups all around the world being created. And there's a big need for entrepreneurs to be able to articulate exactly their unique positioning in a, se in a sector, identify who their competitors are, but also how they're different. How, how clear are you with how you're different than Massage Envy or anybody yeah. else that you compete with, whether it's the solo you know, practice or group of, 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 of folks in a particular city. I, I'm glad you brought that up, Steve, because it's so critical, especially in healthcare, this complicated industry we're in, to be crystal clear, right? To have that unique, simple positioning. So I would say the, the old zeal, I couldn't even describe it to people myself. Whereas the new that's zeal, what, that's, right. a that's, that's, what, that's a red flag. Right? It's a huge red yeah, flag yeah. if the CEO and founder of a company can't even tell people what his own company does. And I think a lot of companies in healthcare can't quite articulate what they do very well. So we work really hard to stay super focused on this one idea and not to think about, well, let's add this other category or let's now add 30 kinds of massage to the list or you know, let's allow people to you know, I don't know, get a massage, you know, at a restaurant. I mean, it's, it's very, very specific for a reason because we want it to be simple. You know? And elegant. And you talked about, you know, I think it, very early on, I remember you focusing on user experience and the ability because you're focusing on one service like this to be able to just per perfect right. an experience for the massage therapist yep. and a massage yep. a, a experience so for the consumer. Relative to Massage Envy, the positioning for us is very clear. We're more convenient. We're open earlier and later than they are. We're on demand, so you actually can get an appointment in an hour. You really can't do that a lot of these massage envies. We have higher quality, so we pay the therapist better. We do cost more. You know, we're roughly 50% more for the, to the consumer than a massage envy. And they're, how, they're, so how, how much does, a, does a, a massage cost with Zeal? And I know there's both one-offs, but there's also a subscription. There's also a subscription. And Massage Envy is only a subscription company, um, interestingly. So in general, nationwide, Massage Envy all-in is about 70 bucks for massage, and we're all-in 99. So, you know, roughly... 50%. All in, including tip, tax, everything. Tip, tap, ninety-nine dollar massage, and then what ninety-nine if, versus seven. And what if yeah. I what what if I um, want to have them come to my office or do something? Same more? thing, yeah, same thing. So is it yeah. easier to position yourself against maybe another established player in the same industry, or to use an analogy, um, maybe compare? Uh, you know, there's a lot of companies that call themselves the Uber of because because people are so um, excited about that model. They've experienced it. They love it. Right. Um, you know, talk a little bit about from the entrepreneur's perspective um, in positioning. You know, what's the strategy there? Do you try to go one route versus, versus the other? That's actually a good question. And um, I mean, it's probably a cop out to say the answer is both, mm -hmm. but it is both because what I've realized is that I think for techies and for investors, the Uber of, you know, works for them. They understand what that means from a technology perspective, from a fundraising perspective, right? Just from the perspective of how the company works. But I got to say for the consumer, a lot of our consumers are 40 plusers, right? We're, we're, are we all 40 plusers? Yeah. <laughs> you know, we got I mean, aches. 40 now. Yeah, are, 40. You, are you 40? <laughs> okay, so we've got aches and pains, right? And, um, you know, for us, if you're interested in massage, like a lot of our 40 plusers are, I think whether it's massage envy or bliss, or you just tell them about, hey, getting a private massage at home, I think that resonates more with them than the Uber of. I mean, some of them get Uber, they're using Uber, so like, oh, okay, I get it, I press a button. But ultimately, the real positioning for them is, hey, this is more convenient than any other option out there you could possibly imagine. It's 
open later. That's the other interesting stat I've been telling people. 26% of all our orders now are after 9 p.m. When every place else is closed, we are serving people and giving them massages when they actually want them, right before bed, so you can get a good night's sleep. You can't even do that outside do of you, Do you actually close? I mean, can you order, can you order it? You uh, can order up to 10.30 p.m. start time, so, you know, like, we routinely will have a husband-wife get back-to-back 90-minute -back yeah. massages. That means the therapist is there from 10.30 till, you know, about 1.40 in the morning. So how, how, are, how are people finding out, of the consumer, how's, how are people finding out about Zeal? I mean, well, how are you reaching everyone? The best way, right, all the VCs always say this, and we entrepreneurs, I think, need to push it, is word of mouth. Right? The absolute best customers we're getting are people who are just telling other people or pressing the invite friends button in the app to invite somebody um, or buying them a gift certificate. And those customers are gold. Of course, we buy customers too. We advertise on Facebook and Google, and that's terrific too. Because if somebody's on Google searching for in-home massage tonight, we pop up. They'll click and they buy. And so, that happened so the how, other day in Oakland, for example. Sure. How important has it been for you now that you've simplified your positioning down to you know, press a button, get a massage, you can now describe it, your team can describe it, your investors know what it is, your, yep. your various audiences. Talk about, you know, as you relate that to your, this word of mouth strategy, because one of the things is if your customer can't describe something to someone else, then, then how are they going to refer it? Has, has that been a big part of the success? I think so, yeah, yeah. But also because it's so simple, like I said, this invite friends feature, I tell people we're not always so clever, right? A lot of us copied Uber's, you know, iPhone dispatch system. And so they originally, I believe, came up with that where you literally just press the button in the iPhone and Apple created a nice little interface in iOS so that the, the, immediately when you do, you know, you can integrate Facebook, Twitter, email, and text right into the invite. And when you press one of those four, immediately opens up you know the mechanism and then you can put the person's name in and hit submit it's so easy I mean, imagine in the old days right when we were running these web 1.0 <laughs> companies you couldn't do that well, stuff you're, right. you're right. right in fact let's let's i want to talk about that for a second because i know you're a mobile first company you think about and have redesigned this from the mobile perspective not the web perspective even right. though you can access this on on, on the web um, how much of this is about timing right now could this service have been offered 10 years ago um, well, interestingly, people did offer this service 10 years ago and 15 years ago. It was all web-based or 800 number-based. So it was not easy to do, right? It wasn't magical, but you could do it. It just it was very hard, obviously, to aggregate demand and get this, figure out where the supply mm -hmm. was. So yeah, the short answer is really not very possible, not, not in a scalable way, right? Because the way people were doing it 10 and 15 years ago is, oh, you want a massage on the corner of 15th and 9th? You know, you got to get on the phone and start calling therapists and seeing who might be around or who's going to take the order, and you have no clue where they are. They could be 10 miles away. Um, so you were able to service it, but it, w it wasn't easy. It was very costly, too. So you, you were joking uh, before we started taping about the fact that you, you give advice to entrepreneurs. You give, you, the advice you give entrepreneurs, sometimes you don't, you know, don't remember yourself or you don't follow yourself. Yeah. Well, what, what's some of that around positioning and marketing? I think... Um, this episode, we're zeroing in on you know the unique positioning of Zeal, but I want to I want to get a little bit more yeah. from you around Me what you're talking. Meaning the advice, not the things he doesn't. Follow. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. I mean, there's so many things I don't do. I screw up. Well, you know, I, I think there's a tendency among entrepreneurs to you know put a lot of features in their product, right? And, and I'm always telling entrepreneurs you know, about simplicity and about focus and about fewer features, and yet I'm always trying to put in too many features. So I think with the new zeal, I definitely have been much, much more disciplined when our team members come up, oh, we need this extra feature. My instinct now is always, no, we are not adding another feature. And of course, I'm not that you know, you know, crazy about it because we talk about it and there could be a good reason to add some sort of feature. But ju just trying to resist that urge to add more features, add more complexity, I mean, in some ways, you know, we're still a little too complex now. You know, um, you know, the app has multiple different price levels. Um, uh, you know, it, it has three kinds of massage right now. I always insisted we would have two, but three was right. The third one we added was prenatal. A lot of lot of pregnant women who who need relief from you know the pains of of pregnancy. So, so again, I'd say that's the big one. That's the really big one that I just, I made the company too complex early on. It was very, very hard to unravel all that. And now that you're simple, just to resist that urge, 
you know, to just start adding it, all it these It seems like that's categories. a constant battle to constantly keep it simple. Yeah, it is. It fe is. Feature creep. Feature creep. Well, yeah, and your customers are the problem, right? Because you'll go to them with this, you know, service or product, and they'll say, well, that's kind of cool, but can you give me this? And early on, you don't want to say no to any customer, right? You want the money. You want to make them happy. You need the customer. So there's this tendency, and it happened at Vault. Oh, sure, we'll do that. Next thing you know, we have, you know, eight revenue lines. Not one of them is that good, and they're all distracting us from maybe something that could be core and big. All right. So what, what about other um, advice? You, you started outside of health and wellness. Now you've been in it for a few years. What's your experience been like? What would you tell other entrepreneurs who may be thinking about coming over to, to healthcare? Yeah. Well, I respect the real healthcare entrepreneurs, right? The ones that are tackling the complexity and in insurance, right? Hospitals. I mean, in some ways, what we're doing is much easier. I've got to say, right? We're 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 not in the regulatory scheme to any major in any major sure. major way, right? We've got licensing with therapy, and obviously, you know, massage therapy has some rules around it. But there's no HIPAA compliance, you know, in massage therapy. There's no submitting of insurance paperwork. So. I'm just saying, if you're going to come into the healthcare world, get ready. I mean, it's, it's tough, right? But startup health obviously can help you navigate that stuff. Um, and there is no better time. It's the biggest industry on the planet, right? And in the U.S. here, you know, especially. And it's so <clears throat> complex, right? It's so fraught with friction that there's real opportunities to create value. Bigger than ever. Mm. It's very exciting. So I'd say come. Come and, you know, Do you it. apply your wisdom, now. right? Fix this industry. Do you, do you feel, you know, and I want to talk about um, a little bit of how you're measuring your progress, um, a little bit about metrics. Um, yeah. how, what are the two or three metrics that you yeah. look at as a CEO on a regular basis, and how are you pushing your team and syncing your team around that? Yeah. These metrics are the same for all businesses, right? It's how many customers did we win today? How many did we keep from last month, right? So, so the churn. building up of the number of customers, the measuring of the churn. How often are customers using the service, right? The repeat rate. And then we're measuring, obviously, the cost to acquire a customer and ultimately the profits we're making off of customers. You can ultimately calculate this lifetime value figure that everybody wants to know about. So, you know, at a base level, it's just like, how many orders did we get today? We're always looking at that first. But then we start to dig below and just, you know, how is each city doing and how many more customers are we adding and how many customers are we satisfying? Do you look at the net promoter score? Do you ask people to ref about well, it, their referability? Well, it's, well, it's funny. We, um, somebody was telling me about the net promoter score recently and they were like, oh, you have to ask this question of people. But then I pointed out, well, we do ask every customer to rate the therapist and write comments. So in a way, we are doing that. Sure. So yeah, we do know that, even though we're not calling it net promoter score. We know across tens of thousands of massages what everyone's getting rated, right? What that That's about satisfactory rate, rate right? Mm -hmm. So how satisfied yeah, are they? Yeah. And are you doing that both ways like, like Uber does where you the therapist gets rated, but exactly. also, the, 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 also the, customer. the customer gets rated as well. So before a therapist goes into a home, they can look up the rating of a of an existing customer. Exactly, yeah. and, and also read the notes, yeah. actually, which is also becoming more critical. Yeah, the net, the net promoter score, and you know, we use it at Startup Health for um, the companies that we introduce and, and connect to investors and customers and partners, which is how likely are you to refer this uh, company to your partners, to your colleagues, to other investors as a, as a way to see about the, yeah. you know, the viral nature of the, you know, the company. Can the, and are the, is the company in a position to be, you know, at the top of the referral list? And I think it's an interesting one for you guys as you talk about the success of how often people are referring zeal to other people. It seems like a lot. So it's probably, you probably have a high net promoter score we do, is my guess. We do. Yeah. Um, and you're reminding me, this is very important in healthcare because what we've noticed at Zeal is, say, unlike a food delivery company or unlike Uber, healthcare in general, right, massage specifically, is a very um, private affair, right? People are generally right. not tweeting and Facebooking about their healthcare. And so I think the, the, the challenge all of the healthcare companies have, I mean, Zeal included, even though we're not quite as private, but we're still pretty private, is that this thing is done in the home. People aren't posting pictures of themselves getting massages. <laughs> and, not, yet. You know, not, so, yet. Not, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. So while they're raving about the service, so they might be raving about one of our great startup health companies, maybe among their friends at a table, they're not putting it out there for the world. And so it's very different than Uber. 
where you know you order the car at the dinner table and everyone's asking you, what are you doing and then the car shows up and everyone on the sidewalk sees it with the uber sign and right. what is that and then you and all your friends pile in and so now your friends are like well i want this can you tell me how it works that really doesn't happen in healthcare right people are very quiet about it so so there isn't as much virality, and I think you have to think about that when you're doing a healthcare company. How, how do we spread the word? How do we get people to talk about this and share it without revealing their sensitive you know, health information? And it's an interesting, interesting challenge, another tweak on, on how difficult it is to navigate in, the, in this market. So you, you've been a part of Startup Health from the very beginning. You were part of the uh, first group of companies to join. It's been it's been fantastic watching you navigate because we were you joined as part of kind of Zeal One One O. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that that I think is always interesting about you know watching a, an entrepreneur navigate each of these different pivots of of, of learning about their business is um, how they you know look at the past mistakes and you know don't make them again necessarily but you you make new ones um what would you say is the biggest lesson learned of the last three years that you've had building seal oh easy just don't spend too much money mm -hmm. i mean really i know that sounds simplistic but you know you can figure it out in a startup but you have to be around to figure it out so if you're spending a lot of money, and we were burning a lot of money in the beginning because we just were convinced that our initial idea was the one. And so you know, I ramped up to 14 people and we started building this huge massive website and creating all this content and all these software tools for the vendors, but we hadn't validated all this stuff. So, so it's we, knowing when to spend money. Yeah, yeah. Like, so if you just spend a little bit of money, you keep your team lean, you really listen to the customer, you know, and it can, it can take a while, right? It took us 18 months to finally see it, but um, it would have been nice to have spent much, much less money in that 18-month <laughs> right. period. Because what ended up happening at the end of that whole process is we basically had to raise all new money to start all over again with this new idea. And I think had we not, you know, had we stayed lean, we could have just done that with the existing capital we Got, raised. Gotta love the sounds of New York, given that we're taping yeah, in oh, New York, okay. the horns. Love and, New yeah. York. <laughs> so you, you've successfully pivoted, you've, you've got this great company that's growing. What, what's next for Zeal? Oh, I mean, it's just the beginning, right? We, um, we've got to get a lot more customers in each city, right? We've got to satisfy these guys in their cabs who are obviously right. angry. <laughs> right? Get them some more massages. They need um, a massage. Everybody, in, everybody New in New York needs a massage. Needs a massage. <laughs> this place is too stressed out. Yeah, yeah we, we barely scratched the surface. I mean, you know, uh, the American Massage Therapy Association says that 40 million Americans get at least one massage a year. Now, 20 of those get only one. So they're probably not going to get more than their usual one. But 20 million people are getting multiple massages per year. And we only have, you know, many thousands of, you know, customers. So you think they'll be covered by health insurance at some point as part of our wellness program? I do. Yeah. We, we already have customers who are using their HSA and FSA cards. Oh, that's what to, I do. Yeah. yeah to, uh, to buy Zeal Massage. And we've modified a receipt for some of those people because they'll have a prescription from their doctor for medical massage and so we deliver that to them and then they can submit the so we'll, we'll we'll formalize that in a bigger way I think over time and I think more companies will start to buy uh, massage you know at home for their employees right now we have companies buying massage like you guys we, do we here. use it here at startup health yeah and for it's, chair massage great. we've got over 100 companies doing that as a, like a nice little office perk de-stress people you know a couple times is that lunch. an area of growth do you think for for zeal do you want to keep yeah, focusing on corporate subscriptions well what's been interesting about the corporate subscription is it's a good way to introduce the brand to employees and it's a good way to tell the company here's what we do you know consider buying a massage for your employees in the home where it's you know even more therapeutic um, but yeah, we're going to keep doing that. Um, it's, it's, a, it's pretty small relative to all the revenue, but it's a great way to get people just hooked on the brand. And we see a decent conversion rate to in-home subscribers after they try us at the office. So I've got a, one, of, one of the final questions is um, related to, I think you're a master of uh, leveraging a peer network. <clears throat> you and I got to know yes. each other uh, in YPO, Young Presidents Organization, which is a global network of CEOs and entrepreneurs uh, across the globe, but as you know, I mentioned earlier, you're part of the Startup Health uh, Peer Network um, for several years now, and I think you've been masterful at making sure you not only tap into it for your own company and your own 
needs, but you also give back a lot and contribute yeah. a lot. What's been one of the more rewarding things you've been able to get out of being a part of the peer network at Startup Health? I mean, there's so many things. It is an amazing network. I mean, from you know getting connections specifically through you guys to Cleveland Clinic or the White House. Um, but I think what's been really terrific about Startup Health and this peer network is um, when we meet once a quarter, you know, usually in San Francisco or New York or Cleveland or DC, uh, and you sit face to face for a couple of days with these people, you start to hear the stories. One, you realize, oh, everybody's going through some of these same challenges, so that's good. I feel, I feel a little bit better. And two, what are other people doing to address these challenges? So I know that I have picked up little nuggets from my peers. Oh, that's how you address that issue around 1099 contracting. And then you'll have a little you know, side meeting to really dig into it. Oh, and you can connect me to um, you know, this specific vendor you use to put together your stock option plan? Great. You know? and so, so you end up saving a lot of time, a lot of money. You get validation. And then I do the same back, right? They say, oh, did you, uh, you know, how did you build your mobile app? And you know, I'll start to tell them, here's what we did, here's what we learned. Don't do this, try this. And that, you, know, you see the look on people's faces. Oh my gosh, I just saved a bunch of time. And you know, thank you for that lead. Now I can go call that programmer and you know, hire him too, because you tell me he's terrific. Fantastic. Well, it's great. It's great to have you as a healthcare transformer in startup health and very excited about uh, zeal.com's success. So and really looking forward to Thursday, we, every other Thursday, zeal in the office, zeal in the office. Uh, <laughs> massages. Yes, and so. I, as I mentioned, next time we have you on, we're going to have massages the entire time. Let's do that. And this Thursday, you have the yeah. zeal chair, you know, because my new office is across the street. So Perfect. This is great. Come, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come, come over. Come, come on over. I'm so come right so over. people should go where to download the app? App Store, Zeal.com? Yeah, go on Zeal. the App Store and go into Google Play for the Android version. Um, we also have links off our website at Zeal.com. Fantastic. Excellent. Thanks, Emmer. Thank you thanks, so much. Guys. Thank you all right. Very much. Uh, thanks for listening to today's episode. And uh, like all episodes, you can go to startuphealth.com slash now to see all of the episodes. And uh, Samer, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, thank you. Unity.